very talented musician. A brilliant way to kick off today's proceedings. And we have a packed show for you. The hashtag is, of course, World Connected, and we encourage you to interact online. Plus, an epic greeting to our eSports athletes in the audience today. Please give us a wave. We wish you the best of luck over the weekend. Thank you for being here for the grand opening. Well, it's time for our very first panel. Hello, everybody. How are we this morning? All right. Hello. Well, this is our session on the role of eSports in a world connected. And I have the pleasure and honor of sitting with some formidable people today. And it's worth remembering that our post-pandemic world accelerated our digital connectivity. Being online was a lifeline for many, not just in eSports, but outside of the world of eSports and gaming. And many industries looked to us as a powerful indicator of how to support people remotely. So we're going to hear more about the interactivity between creativity, gaming, and the wider world. We're going to kick things off by giving each panelist the opportunity to introduce themselves and what they do, and a quick line or two on how they became interested in eSports. Katie, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go across the stage, and I'll introduce the next people too. Hi, I'm Katie Sadlier. I'm the Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Um, my, my more recent uh, is the connection with esports has been through through Paul and the the MOU that we have established between the Commonwealth Games Federation and the Global Esports Federation. But um, like one of our opening speakers, I have a nephew who's a swimmer and a gamer, and so I've always always fascinated about what was going on um, in his mind as he flipped between the two. So long-term follower and really fascinated about um, this forum, and really looking forward to tomorrow watching the athletes p compete. Thanks, Katie. Ooh. Thank you, Katie. Next up, let's have Paul. Who you are, what do you do, and how you became interested in eSports. Thanks. Thanks, LJ. Uh, good morning, everyone. And a big shout out to the athletes, first of all. Welcome. It's great to have you here. And so, yeah, Paul Foster, the CEO at um, Global eSports. And um, after uh, being a gamer in my younger years and uh, at school, um, I then um, worked in, I was fortunate in my home um, city of Sydney to be part of the organizing committee for the Olympic Games back in 2000. So, and that, um, I had the chance to um, work in the Olympic movement for about 20 years. And then um, I feel like I found eSports and eSports found me. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I love about what we've been able to do, particularly LJ for the athletes, is create together with our friends at the Commonwealth Games Federation, this incredible stage. So this stage is for you and we're excited that you're able to be here. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Oh, thanks very much, Paul. That was lovely. Um, Philip, you're next. Who are you? What do you do? And what brought you to eSports? I'm Philip Millevert. I'm heading the sports section at the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, that most of you won't know. Uh, our role is mainly preventing conflicts in the world through education, science, and culture. And uh, UNESCO's role in sport is to ensure that everyone can participate, no one is discriminated, that sport serves the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, and fulfills the education purposes, health purposes, inclusion purposes that you all can contribute to as athletes but also as a federation. I didn't find my way to eSports, eSports found their way to me <laughs> and I'm actually now finding it because uh, in the last days uh, I've been seeing uh, an impressive power, power of, of eSports to change lives to engage you young, young people uh, in friendships, in skills development, uh, and definitely we have to have that on our radar. In UNESCO, we deal with a number of other, uh, with all the sports in the world, and we feel very comfortable as well with the Commonwealth Secretariat. We have a very strong partnership. The Commonwealth is clearly leading sport policy development around the world over the last decades, and also with the Global Esports Federation, we feel uh, in very good hands to make this sport a real good tool for, uh, for improving the lives of people. Wow, very exciting, thank you. Next up we have Andy. Could you please say who you are, what you do, and what brought you to eSports? Hello there, um, my name's Andy Payne. Um, what do I do? A lot, I'm very, very <laughs> lucky in that um, since 1985, I've worked in video games. So I've worked all my life in video games. I fell into it, I love it. Each day I get up, including today, I just, can't think, can't thank whatever 
the luck was that got me into it. <laughs> I've been into esports now for um, eight, nine years. Um, I was a shareholder at ESL, which was the biggest independent uh, esports company recently sold to the uh, Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, same company that bought um, Newcastle United Football Club. Um, and uh, I'm the, the, the chair of the British Esports Association. Um, it gives me great pleasure to see the opening guests and their remarks, um, to have politicians take the video games and esports industry seriously. Um, that's been happening for some time. I, I worked uh, to lobby government. Uh, I, I've sat in some very tedious meetings where people don't understand the power of video games. Um, they don't understand the community. They don't understand the friendships. And they don't understand the economic growth and joy that video games and esports bring to the planet. So I just want to say to the athletes, absolutely fantastic. I just kind of makes me cry <laughs> to see this <laughs> because we've been waiting, you know, I've been waiting all my life to see this kind of stuff happen. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you might think sort of old bloke with grey hair and glasses. Um, I don't usually wear glasses and I certainly don't normally wear a shirt and tie or anything like that, but I thought I'd better make a special episode today <laughs> because this is a formal event. But, you know, video games has been my life and it's been many of the people in this audience life. All of you who are discovering esports and video games, welcome. It's the most fantastic global community and it's going to drive change in the world and deliver world peace. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Andy. I think we feel quite lucky to share this moment with you too. Right, let's have some more questions. Katie, I'm going to come back to you. You've been quiet for a little while. <laughs> it's your turn. Could you please tell me some surprising ways that sports you and esports positively impact the world? Oh, what? have I forgotten? <gasps> I've forgotten somebody. This is terrible. <laughs> Zeno, I am so very, very sorry. That question will have to wait. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Zeno, hello. Please, could you tell the audience, slightly later than planned, okay. who you are, what you do, and what brought you to eSports? Thanks. Um, my name is Zena Waldridge, and I'm the president of the World Squash Federation. And, and I'm the traditional sport here on the panel, so I don't deem to be an expert at eSports, but there are plenty of experts here to, uh, to support that. Um, I think that, um, for me, I, I love that combination of technology and sport. Um, squash, I think, lends itself to the application of technology. Um, and I think we are, we've been a Commonwealth sport since 1998 and it's the pinnacle of our sport. And I think we're not Olympic. And I think sitting on the edge of, uh, of being Olympic has driven um, us to innovate as a sport. And I think that's been really good for us. Uh, we've innovated in lots of ways, including if you've seen squash, it's played in a glass box. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, we, we've managed to in improve presentations and. Uh, I think it really lends itself to the application um, of eSports technology and, and that, that bridge between traditional sports and eSports, I think we're already part of our way across the bridge and I can feel that eSports is coming from any other direction and it will be great to, to meet in between and I just think there's, there's, there are lots of ways in which we can learn from eSports and apply some of the technology and thinking from, from eSports into our sport to improve both the presentation, the understanding, the tactics of the sport. Um, so there's lots of ways, I think, in, in which we can combine um, technology and eSports with the traditional sports, particularly, I think, with, with reaching new audiences. Um, I think that's really important for us to, to partner with eSports in terms of um, bringing new, young audiences into our sport. And indeed, our, our conference this year is in Chennai in India and one of the first items that they had on their list of items for the conference and we had on our list for items for the conference is eSports. So I do think that we will, um, I think we're, we're heading very quickly in the direction of, uh, 
uh, partnering with esports quite strongly. Mm. The multiple surfaces on the game of Swash would lend itself very well to augmented reality, cool looking stats at the point of impact. I can see it all already. Um, thank you so much, Zena. I'm sorry I missed you out earlier. Um, we'll come back to you very shortly, and we're going to go back to Katie, who already knows I'm going to ask about these surprising ways sports and esports positively impact the world. Clearly, you're slightly happy the Commonwealth Games are here in Birmingham. Absolutely. I mean, you know, anyone who's been walking around outside this building sees what an absolutely amazing job that Birmingham and the organizing committee have done to bring on the games. And this is just that extra special bit, like my, my president, Dame Louise Martin, sort of said. Really excited. I mean, I, like, I mean, it's not every day that you're going to sit on a stage like this. Um, and I've been giving a lot of awards and, and a lot of presentations and speeches, so you, you just kind of feel that energy. And I think the really, the, the really exciting thing about our partnership, our long-term partnership with the Global Esports Federation is, is what we can learn from each other. You know, I, I, you know I, I, when I describe esports, I, I say it's technologically prolific, <laughs> it's content savvy, it's really socially connected, and it really, it, it also has a, a really strong values which align with what we, we, uh, we think is important in terms of the Commonwealth. So, um, you know, whilst we might be 100 years old and you might be 100 years young, the, the kind of way that we evolve together in, in understanding what the strengths and, and opportunities are of, of both ecosystems is, is really exciting for us. Wow, yes, that's brilliant, and thank you. Paul, during our conversations offline, I'm always stunned by the breadth of knowledge you bring from other areas into esports. I wonder if you can share some more things that have surprised you as you've explored a world connected. Yeah, I, thanks, uh, LJ, for the question. I, I just want to give a shout out to Katie. Sadly, I thought that was something really powerful, what she said, in the sense that um, a traditional organization, you know, a hundred years, what an incredible mm. legacy and what an incredible history, rich history, and a young organization and a, and a, and a young movement, um, as Andy mentioned, around esports, um, can really come together. So our whole notion around um, our motto, hashtag World Connected, is really the power that we have when we come together. Zena talked about it as well, and Philippe talked about it as well. Imagine the power what we could do is if we actually came together and do good stuff together and share our knowledge together and hang out together and have fun together. Andy, I think that's something we should talk about more as well. We've got to have fun. This is esports. <laughs> and, um, and I think Katie said it really well. Like when we come together, there's some beautiful union in the middle, all of us, um, and that, that's really a human quality. And when I think about games, I think humans were made to play games. As young kids, we played games. You know, when we sat up here, we played games um, to get to know each other. Um, and it's no great surprise, as uh, the mayor said, um, Andy Street, that specifically in this part of the world, um, with the Industrial Revolution and the advances in technology, it's no surprise to me that we're now playing games electronically. And we're now creating esports, which is really stages like this to let athletes shine. And as our president said, to tell stories in the way, the unique ways that athletes want to tell them. Mm, brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Philip, you've been working with UNESCO, and that, like you said earlier, specializes in sharing educational, scientific, and cultural knowledge for a better world. It sounds like it's brilliant to do. It feels like esports is a natural fit with the United Nations Agency. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little more on where you can see the role of esports developing. Well, maybe I start with World Connected. United Nations is World Connected, connected through common values, human rights that we all agree upon. The whole world agreed on a set of values uh, that we want to have as a bottom line for everything we do. And second, purpose. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a common agenda. Everyone agreed upon them, all the countries in the world, including civil society, business, uh, and these are things we share all, right? And we want to put this set of objectives and values to the uh, uh, use of sports federations, traditional ones and new ones. Uh, that's the path we want to go with you. We have collective work is another, and this is what you know best, the athletes, right? Collective connectivity. We can't achieve all the objectives we want to have set ourselves if we are not connected and work uh, uh, together. And this is what you do so much in, in, in e-games. We have uh, launched last year uh, initiative Fit for Life that tries to break down silos. We have traditional sports, new sports, we have health, we have education, we have a lot of data 
a lot of technology, but it's scattered. And we have really huge challenges in the world. We have a world health crisis. Physical health and mental health are declining. People don't move enough. We have an education crisis. Access to education is uh, uh, very scarce in many parts of the world. And we have inequalities, inequalities between countries, but also within countries. We see sport and esports as a fantastic opportunity to overcome these huge challenges, especially through young people being the drivers of change and not just beneficiaries. And then here come esports again. We have young people uh, with fun, right? That fun is energy. It's not just uh, uh, something that is good for you, but we can use that pleasure that connectivity to really change the world to become a better place and fit for life has that objective. That's a brilliant observation. Fun isn't frivolity, especially when it comes to education. I certainly learn a lot better through play. Thanks, Philip. Um, Andy, as chair of eSports, you've been part of eSports probably before the term even existed, I would imagine. So could you tell us a little about how it's evolved and what you think has contributed to today's gaming landscape? I guess it's like a state of the union. Well, that's a big question. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what we're here to try and answer. Um, so I think Philip uh, and Paul make really good points about you know, having fun. It all starts with fun and it all should end with fun. And you can learn a lot on the way. Um, and video games... Um, fundamentally have rule sets and as players and these guys in that corner will definitely know this you know you've got choice and consequence you make a choice in a game you get a consequence you learn a rule set you learn how to behave within your communities you learn how to make friends you know how to take people on be competitive you learn how to win you learn how to lose video games have of over time developed from you know uh, person versus computer to person versus person, to people versus people, and collaboration within all of that. So all eSports really is, is where a community grows up around a video game, plays it for real, plays it competitively, it's casual to start, and it starts to get much more serious uh, and more competitive and potentially more rewarding. None of the games publishers and games developers set out to make an eSport. What's fundamentally important to understand is it's the players, the community, decide whether this is going to be an eSport. That agency and that power resides with the community, the playing community. And the publishers, developers have to respect that, and they do respect that. Um, and eSports is evolving in parallel with the, with the world of video games. And, and really, it, it allows people to... Um, socialize, to have common culture, to have a common language of the game, um, but also to, to, um, to watch and observe. And when, when, you know, I still get very slightly irritated with even my friends who, who sort of say, well, Andy, why would anyone want to watch anyone playing Dota 2? And I stop them right there and say, so like, you, you play golf, do you, or tennis or some other sport? Do you watch that on television? You know, do, I think you probably do. Why would you possibly watch a bunch of old guys walking around a golf course? You know, why would you do that? Ah, because you can relate to it. Well, that's what esports is about. It is no different from the real world of sport, from traditional sport. And the really interesting thing is that as we co-develop and move into, you know, I don't want to use the word cliched, but the metaverse, we will find that, that traditional physical sport and esports become one. Okay, you will see that, you know, for us gamers, it's it, like we love, our, we, we love our, our, our control pads. Of course we do. Our controllers are really important. But you will see a new generation, if you want to play FIFA or, you know, a sports game, you're likely to get a pair of Nike or Adidas boots that will control the game. And that's how it's going to work and you're likely to get more physicality into it um, as well. And you'll also be able to not put physicality if, if, that, if that floats your boat as well. So I think it's really exciting, and I think that's why it's important. Esports and video games, we are not um, an arrogant industry in any, in any way because we are beholden to the players. And if the players leave our games that we make, <laughs> we're bust. 
right? So you have to respect, support, uh, and encourage the community. And so many opportunities for those community observers, fans, players to, to get into the industry, to see the massive opportunities um, to work globally, um, either from your bedroom or, you know, to pick up your, your bag and move. It's just an amazing world out there. And that, we're only at the beginning, really. I mean, for people like me, I've, I've worked in, you know, since 85, so it's years. But we're getting now, you know, the, in the internet, it's like dog, dog years, right? The internet works like dogs. So, you know, when you've got a little dog and the dog's seven, people go, well, that's the equivalent of 49 years in human years. Well, in the internet, one year's like seven in, in the real world. It moves so fast. And that is brilliant because it's giving, as Philip says, it's bringing opportunities globally at once, which is unbelievable. I mean, I, I'm a massive sports fan. I followed the England football team since 1982 in every single World Cup and European Championship. And I'll be going to Qatar this year. <laughs> Uh, and well done the Lionesses, I'm probably going to switch to watch the women. Um, but I can tell you with the global football community, it's brought, it's brought so much friendship and so much love and fun, right? Um, and it's a community and it's the same in video games. There is no difference. We are one. I think there is a, a shared love of virtuosity, isn't it? Watching somebody who is at the top of their game, be it E or traditional. Katie, I saw you nodding just there. <laughs> um, Thank you, Andy, for your perspective. And Zena, thank you for your patience. Could you tell me, as president of World Squash, it would be wonderful to explore that link between traditional and esports a little bit further. What do you think um, esports could learn from the traditional sports models? Where do you think it could go? Well, I think, I think for if you take a sport like, like squash, and there'll be others as well, I mean, whether it's golf or, or, or tennis, and, but we, because we're a very gladiatorial sport, um, I think it does lend itself really well. Um, and I think there are, there are aspects about how we've developed squash into such a gladiatorial sport that we can, there's a lot of crossover, and I think whilst we can learn a lot from, I mean, I pick, up, pick up some of Andy's points about um, um, that, that whole crossover, we've developed a new platform for, for the rules and refereeing, and we think it's technologically quite advanced. Oh. But now I think about how we could also then start to take it to another level. Um, so we're using video clips and, and learning points, but actually we could take that to a whole new level if we imported some of the, some of the technology about rules and tactics and w how we can learn from that. But I think there is a crossover between the two. Mm. Um, I mean, we just, we, we've also um, now installing the first interactive squash courts. Um, and the advantage of having walls is that actually we turn the front wall into a giant iPad. It's actually touch sensitive. Wow. Um, so you can put all kinds of, it can be educational, it can be skills based. But, you know, we're starting now to see that joining together. We're getting closer together already. Mm. And I think if we do join up, there's a lot we can we can learn from each other. Yeah. But, uh, so, so, yeah, and then, and then uh, I mean... I've learned a little bit more in the last six months about the metaverse. I'm really excited about how we can then get into the world of the metaverse in terms of connecting people together across the internet. There may be some delays at the moment, but you know, technology is improving so quickly, as Andy says. I, I just think it opens up a, a world of opportunities. Quite excited to see how we can, might be able to apply squash in the metaverse. Well, there is something called the tactile internet where latency has got to a point where it's a lot easier. And I remember in Japan, I was filming with the BBC and I had a cat scratch me in real time over Skype once where I was moving a mouse, which was under a dome, and then a cat um, <laughs> in another part of the university was playing with a toy. And every time the cat's paw connected with this toy, I felt a little scratch on my hand that was made from the wire of a garden strimmer. So it didn't actually hurt, it just tickled. But all of that was dealt with as a way of showing a compression algorithm to be able to send information more quickly. So it sounds a little bit strange, but actually there is a little bit of interest behind it. And also, MIT Media Lab did an experiment where they applied football-style commentation and stats to the game of chess. 
And so they had two commentators just kind of getting that excitement over a game of chess, which is traditionally quite a quiet and thoughtful game. So I think the concepts are already there. It's just a question of them coming out of academia and into the real world. OK, clearly, Katie, this year marks an impressive association with the Commonwealth Games Federation. Can you tell us a little about your hopes for the future of this relationship? Well, I see this as very much a long-term learning uh, relationship. Uh, this is a pilot program, and we, co we together are evaluating it in terms of where we go. Um, but we, we do see that there is so much advantage for working very closely with the Global Esports Federation. And, you know, we're at the beginning of a new strategic plan development. Um, our current plan finishes in 2022. And, and how we engage and incorporate technology in esports is definitely something that we're keen to explore. Oh, that's exciting. Thank you. Paul, um, how does the Global Esports Federation develop relationships like this? Where do you start? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes I, I remember when Zeno and I first had a conversation, we came to it from two different worlds, in a sense, and, um, and we listened to each other and um, we shared an opportunity to step forward together without, not, without nece not necessarily being aware of where we'd end up, but just to sort of step forward. And I think when we, as Katie said too, when we reached this partnership with the Commonwealth Games Federation, we um, both knew there would be great advantages to our collective communities and our athletes and the people that um, enjoy the Commonwealth Games and enjoy esports and how could we move forward together, but never ever thinking at that moment that we'd be here in Birmingham. Um, and as Andy said, um, I think together we've created that opportunity and um, you can see all these uh, incredible athletes here today and, and that have come from every single continent on the planet and have come here to Birmingham to take this stage and this is a game changer. So um, in Philippe's organization, UNESCO, traditional organization, a, a global um, uh, powerhouse bringing together education, science and culture across hundreds, nearly 200 member states across the world bring together. And it's this ability, LJ, for these, or this concept about connecting. Mm -hmm. And the possibility is when we connect without being obsessed about the outcome. Just to join, listen, share, and step forward together that I think is extremely powerful. Thank you, Paul. Um, Philip, we are in a fractured world right now, I think and bringing nations together can require a delicate touch. And I'm presuming that because of where you work, you're optimistic about the future working at UNESCO. So I'm wondering if you found any particular ways to unify people in their countries in, in an e-sports context, but also perhaps around sport in general. Sure, sport is what we make out of it. Right? Sport per se is neither good nor bad. And uh, this is why it's so important that the people in the room today are the pioneers of esports. You, it's in your hands to make this sport as, as good for the people who practice it, but also for the societies in which uh, it operates. We have a lot of examples, and this is not just true for esports, it's true for all sports. There's a lot of homework that all sports still need to do wherever they are in the world. Safeguarding is one example, the respect for the participants, access. We have only a few women, I'm very happy to sit uh, with one who are heading a World Sports Federation. That sh should change. Um, we have training, right? There's a lot of potential we see in UNESCO. Of course, education is our mandate, right? Esports being a vehicle for training young people about respect, about cultural diversity. It's in your anthem, right? But there's a lot of potential. You, ha you reach out to billions of people. And we as UNESCO don't think we necessarily need specific training for each sport. There's a lot of commonalities between all sports when it comes to universal values I mentioned earlier. And, uh, and thirdly, outcomes not obsessed, but let's be concerned about the outcomes. Let's also make the clear uh, pitch and the intention that we want to contribute to certain outcomes. How do we measure that? Again, do esports need to do something very specific? I don't think so. All the sports should articulate what they are doing in terms of contributing to their communities, to the families, to the people. 
uh, in a more coherent fashion. We work again with the Commonwealth Secretariat to do that. Uh, so there are tools that we can make available to all the sports organizations. We work with the IOC, obviously, and uh, other sports federations. So there's a lot of commonalities we see across sports that are not so specific to esports. What is specific to esports is technology. And we do need technology to get our act together, uh, to work in common as a community, not just in esports, to really make the world a better place. And this is, I think, where you have a very specific role to play because the skills we need, they are with you, the athletes. You have particular skills. Other uh, sports champions don't have to that extent. And uh, the industry behind you is also a game changer in terms of really trying to have a more data and evidence-based uh, uh, approach uh, to using sport for development. Brilliant, thank you. I think with eSports, we're looking at trying to equalize connectivity across the world, which is obviously how a lot of people access it. So I want to talk a little bit with Andy about this equalizing connectivity. Um, some people aren't happy with their broadband connection here in the UK, but I think that the UK is doing slightly, is slightly further along in terms of broadband access. And can we see a role for eSports in improving infrastructure to give more people the chance to compete on a level playing field? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I went to South Korea, um, was blown away by the South Korean games industry um, back then because it was all online, it was all multiplayer. And the reason it was, there was no retail box industry like we had around the rest of the world. Um, and their industry was driven um, by connectivity. And the South Korean government invested massively uh, at that time in, in, in really fast, fat fiber, okay? Um, and esports sort of was a byproduct of it to the point now where, you know, S South Korea is probably, if you're gonna say which is the best country at esports, probably South Korea, okay? Um, so, however, uh, in the traditional world of video games, um, people generally play games on their PC or their consoles, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo. Um, some of the fastest growing population-wise and appetite for games have been closed out of those markets traditionally because of accessibility um, on an economic basis. In other words, it was always too expensive for people in Southeast Asia, India specifically, to buy consoles. They just couldn't afford it. So Sony and Microsoft did not really invest in those markets. Along comes mobile. Um, along comes smartphones. And everyone laughs at them to start with. Oh, you can't play games on those. You know, nah, 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 nah. If your latest iPhone 13 is probably equivalent to PlayStation 2.75 getting towards three, um, within the next five or six, se seven years, all of the, the, the smartphones that we have, the latest ones in our pockets, uh, will be as fast as a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X. Um, the point I'm making is that the mobile connectivity is kind of moving so fast, and that is opening up the world, um, the whole world, to the opportunity of gaming. And that is just fantastic, because it brings more players, it brings more spectators, it brings more love for the game, and it's financially a driver as well. But it gives that accessibility and that diversity, of, which is what any creative industry, and don't be in, under any uh, doubt whatsoever, video games is highly creative. We have to make, we're like the, the closest, um, sort of closest creative industry to us is not film, not animation, not TV. It's actually architecture. And the reason it is because in video games, we have to blend brilliant storytelling with amazing art and superb engineering, like a building. There's no point designing a building that looks fantastic on the outside if the roof falls in. Okay, it's got to work on the inside, on the outside, and it's got to work for people, which is the key thing. Our industry, video games and esports, is about the players being in charge. It's the agency in the same way that sport, you're in charge if you're playing. Uh, you might not like being in charge, but you're in charge. And that puts us aside from film and TV where you're, you're, you're much more passive, you're a viewer, you know, it's a linear experience, and, and more power to those guys because they make amazing things. So I think accessibility is being driven by the mobile networks. And, y you know, it, it, 
again, people don't understand the economics. They'll say, how is it that there's poverty in parts of Africa and they've all got mobile phones? It's like kind of rubbish memes that go around and tropes and so on. And, and it, the reality is, is that it's far quicker and more economically um, possible to put mobile networks in rather than digging up the land or putting, you know, fibers going across, um, across the sky. So I think the answer to your question is the mobile industry, which is going super fast, uh, is making that happen. Brilliant, thank you. I know that um, there are one billion unbanked people in the world who don't have access to a bank account. And in continents where connectivity is patchy, there's the mobile phone is a lifeline. So it's not just, again, not just frivolous for gaming, it's for banking, it's for interacting, it's even for diagnosing people over the internet. Well, I think we've seen it with the, with, with the, the global pandemic. You know, we've now seen different age groups. So, you know, my parents are still alive. They have become very good at being connected via their devices over Wi-Fi networks, and they can see their grandchildren, they can see their friends. Yeah, this is, this is what Philip says, it's bringing people together, and the outcomes uh, are love, sometimes challenge, and, and fun, and smiles. You know, when you see grandparents smiling over FaceTime or, or Zoom or any other Teams, when you see that, that's technology bringing humans together in a really good way, and that's what games plays that part as well. Mm. In my job at the BBC, uh, a lot of the time people say older people can't use technology, and I say that it's actually about incentive. And my friend's mum didn't want to pick up an iPad, and I said, you know you can take clippings of recipes in the magazine without having to tear out the magazine. You just use your camera, and then it's stored. Suddenly, there's a use case, and suddenly, she's got more invested interest in learning how to use it. And I think it's like an opportunity that we have to teach people and help people become interested. There's no point saying, this thing's amazing, but not explaining why. Um, Zena. Sport often involves breaking down barriers to allow for cooperation through cultural experiences. So how has squash adapted over the years? I know it used to be called squash rackets many years ago. So obviously there's been quite, quite an advancement. You've talked about sort of clear, transparent courts. I wondered if there are any other things that you could talk about. And I also hear there are mini courts around the city of Birmingham at the moment. So please tell us more about the need to reach new and diverse audiences. You know, I think the, the squash world and certainly it, the, sorry, the, the world of international sport becomes more and more competitive. We've got more and more sports coming in. It's a more um, competitive market. And so I think we've got to find more new ways of reaching those audiences. And for, for squash, you know, we have to come, like many sports, come from behind the brick walls and get out there into the community. So it is about developing outdoor squash, um, about getting into playgrounds and parks. We have now the, the portable courts, but equally we've got low cost um, mini courts that can be put in playgrounds because at the end of the day, this is all about, um, it's all about bats and balls. It's all about hitting, hitting a ball against a wall and it can be a playground wall, it, you know, and, and I think the, then how we introduce technology, we can put technology um, into rackets in terms of GPS. Um, we can, we can do all kinds of aspects in terms of technology, but we've got to make it more accessible. Um, you know, break down the boundaries, make it more affordable, more accessible, more visible. And the visibility, I think, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I th and I think how we can use technology, the ways in which we can use technology to, to move that forward, whether it's about materials or, or whether it's about um, internet or, you know, it, 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 it's, all, it's all key to making our sport more visible. And that's where I think eSports just gets us out there into new markets, um, reaching young people and um, our chief executive of World Squash has the, the vision of, of we have a, an eSports championship in the morning and a, a traditional squash championship in the afternoon and um, there's no reason why we can't do that with the right partners. That sounds exciting. I'm just remembering as well the Babalat, one of the tennis racket companies, have a device that's counter, uh, it's counted as coaching so it can't be used during a tournament 
but the player uses the racket and the, the, the racket analyzes the points where the ball is hit, keeps its score, works out the statistics, where the sweet spot is, and it's just yeah. amazing how much you can do. I think that's where we can bring some of the technology of esports into our sport in terms of uh, match analysis, presentation of the sport. Mm -hmm. uh, we can be creating heat maps very easily, even in between games with the technology. So there's all kinds of ways, I think, in which we can improve the performance of the players as well as providing really valuable, interesting feedback that can be for the ordinary player, really a really fascinating, fascinating way in which they can, they can have fun um, whilst, whilst playing the physical game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, there's lots of areas we haven't even explored yet, but the more we, the more we get into the eSport world, and the metaverse, the more we can see how we can apply the technology, the innovation to the sport to, um, I mean, coming back to, to Andy's point, to make it fun, because at the end of the day, it is about fun. And with our World Squash Day last year, the whole, um, the whole theme of the, of the World Squash Day was about making sure we, we, we have fun and we're, bringing, we're making sure we, we're bringing fun into um, front and center of the game. And I think the use of technology in esports will can help us to do that. I think what we need is help with saying, what is that vision? Because we're not experts at esport, um, but we also need people who know all about the technology but understand our sport um, and how we can bring that together to create one vision that we can take forward. Thank you. Paul, it's amazing to see how much the GEF has accomplished in such a short space of time, all of these partnerships that have been developed. I guess the next question is about what you look for in a partner, potential partners. What would they bear in mind if they wanted to approach you, for example? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things you'll see here at the forum and across the Commonwealth Esports Championships just outside in the Innovation Showcase is indeed, and I encourage everyone to have a look at it, is um, our global partner Refract technologies that has worked with um, has worked with Taekwondo in particular you'll see that today and also with um, uh, World Archery um, but is also um, being contacted by many of the world's uh, sport federations to help them on that journey Zena about how to start the conversation and about how to think about it so um, yeah I think the chat despite us talking about World Connected it's not easy <laughs> it's not easy connecting everyone. It's not easy to get one together um, uh, to make the world a better place and to enjoy um, uh, being together and enjoying play. I mean, uh, that, that's definitely challenging. So I think when we, we often, um, LJ, get approached by different organizations to think how we can come together and how we can collectively um, collaborate for effective good. Um, but one of the biggest challenges that we face still is how we connect to athletes, how we connect to cities across the world that want to host, how we connect with organizations across the world that want to do good but not quite sure how to go about that, how we bring traditional, not only traditional sports but also traditional mindsets um, forward and we typically do that in a very gentle way and in a way that encourages participation and a sense of belonging. Like, Come and join, have a conversation, be with us. And again, I come back, I, take, I acknowledge what Philip said about, um, you know, there is a need to have um, some objective setting, I think, and some guidelines, but also being brave enough to maybe take that first step and maybe even the second and third step. Okay, thank you. Andy, can you tell us a little more about how traditional sports are influencing esports games and the other way around? I know FIFA 23 will now include women, women's side um, and things like that. Um, well, there's, the, the truth is that there's always been a, a very heavy connection between um, traditional sports and video games and therefore esports. Um, probably the, the biggest mover in that market has, has and probably always will be Electronic Arts, who spent a lot of time and considerable amounts of money and effort to to do licensing, you know, Madden Football, big thing in you know in in, in America, FIFA, which has been a relationship, is coming to an end. Actually, it's kind of interesting, not surprising that's coming to an end. Actually, but that's been a relationship for 30 plus years. Um, I think there's, I think there's 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 games sports that are founded in the real world. Uh, sounds terrible to say the real world, but you know, you know what I'm saying. And they transition into 
um, the video games world perfectly naturally. Uh, you know, sort of Tiger Woods golf was a massive game back in the day. But now games have also always had their own unique properties um, that don't necessarily exist as a traditional sport. Um, I think the relationships um, between the traditional sports and esports are building all of the time. And it's going to be very interesting to see um, what Electronic Arts does with their football franchise. Um, no surprise to hear me say that it will be fantastic because they've spent 30 plus years building up an incredibly creative team and an engineering team to build that game. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and it'll be also interesting to see what um, good old FIFA do when they um, try and make their own game. <laughs> uh, we'll see. I wish them the very best of luck with that. Uh, it may take longer than they perhaps think. So, but I do think that there is really um, good relations between the licensing authorities and organizations in sport and the, the, the powerful video games publishers. Um, you know, some of you may have read recently that Activision Blizzard King, which was probably the biggest video games um, company in the world, was bought by Microsoft to own Xbox. And, you know, it was just a shade under $80 billion. And it wasn't $80 billion in share swaps, it was $80 billion in cash. Wow. Um, so you can see the value here. And you can see how um, also within development, within video games development, you don't have to be a mega publisher or developer to be able to do things. Um, we've heard today about Silicon Spa in Leamington Spa, not far from here. There's 20 companies at least I can name there. Um, big and small, but, but mainly small. Teams of 15 people um, can make incredible video games. And therefore, for other sports, there are options. You don't have to go into to bat with the, you know, the behemoth of a publisher. It should take forever. There are options. And I think that's the innovation. Um, you know, new sports are coming along all the time. Guess what? New video games are coming all the time. And remember that the video games publishers don't set out to make an eSport, or at least they don't profess to. Mm -hmm. The community and the players decide. That's the key thing. That's what keeps it fresh. There, it, you know, in five years' time, there will be a bunch of new eSports that people will play, but there'll still be, you know, Dota 2, CSGO, probably Rocket League. Those games, Fortnite, will still be massive. These games take huge amounts of engineering to keep them live, um, and massive amounts of innovation. Um, and I would, because I'm a video games person, I, you know, I'm, I'm protective about my industry. I'm proud because we are on that sort of NASA. You know, I, as a kid, I was brought up watching, you know, people go to the moon, and it was like, this is amazing. One day I want to go there. We don't seem to do that anymore, but we're making the most amazing video games today that when you look back, you know, 10 years, you think, wow, we're going places. You know, in the next 10 years, <laughs> we haven't even started. It's just amazing. And the opportunities for people to, to take part in that industry, um, in our industry, in your industry, are insanely brilliant. So get on, learn your maths, learn your art, learn your engineering skills, have an open mind, an open heart, and play. Thank you. I think that community drives technology in a way that a lot of people haven't seen before. Not many people might be aware that hashtags actually were generated by the users. That's what something that Twitter kind of saw, jumped on and took advantage of. And I think that the companies that listen to the users, the players, are the ones that are going to stand the test. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely spot on there. The, the community keeps the games makers honest, right? This is, this is the stakeholder, this is player power, and that honesty is really important. You know, we don't want to be preached to by big companies. We want our games to, be, to, to carry on the way we want them as a community. Thank you very much. Um, Katie, obviously there's been quite a lot of Commonwealth games going on over the last few days. I wonder if there's anything that you've learned just recently from what's happened in Birmingham that you're going to take forward to the future? 
Oh, there's lots. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, we're a kind of organization that is um, ears open, listening, listening, learning. Uh, you know, I, I met with the chef de missions this morning and, 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 and put out that open invitation to say, what more can we do to make this better and better and greater and greater? And, you know, a, a bit like why we're doing um, this pilot and looking to work with uh, the Global Esports Federation to evaluate how we can make sure that the partnership works better and the, the actual product. So, I mean, I've had a fascinating time. It, it's been an, an amazing games under incredibly difficult situations, but Bir Birmingham has pulled it off, uh, and uh, there's there's lots that we will take forward, but we'll tweak all the way, and then that's that's what great organizations do. It's when things are great, you look at them and you make them better. So there's there's lots to take on board. Oh, thank you. There's certainly a buzz when I la when I came out of the train station, and just everybody has that magical feeling about it. So it's very lovely to experience. Um, so I think what we're going to do, uh, it's time to wrap soon, but what I'm going to do first is give each of you a chance to develop beyond today's panel. And the way I do that is to give you a couple of questions, and you can choose to answer either or both of them, as long as the answers are nice and brief. And the double question I'm going to give you is, what do you need help with and or how can you help others? Okay, so that's what do you need help with and or how can you help others? And it's just a chance for the panel to understand where they can help or where that you can help them, but also a chance for you to put out some, some feelers for what you would like to happen next, okay? So, Zeno, I'm going to start with you. What do you need help with? What would you like to do to help others? Um, I think in terms of world squash, I think what we need help with is to accelerate our involvement in esports by help with the vision going forward. Um, we're a small organisation and we have to partner with others and we have to bring others on board to help us. So it's finding those others to help us build a vision for esports that we can, we can then implement um, as a small organisation. Um, how can we help others? I, I think we can help others by... Um, helping our own communities by helping them to grow by giving them the tools and I think the development of esports is one way of doing that of, of providing our communities with the help and support they need to grow the sport at grassroots level and and that can be equally it doesn't matter whether they're a small federation or they're a large federation um, it's providing them with all kinds of new resources and I think esports needs to be part of that that overall package Brilliant. Thank you very much, Zeno. Philip, over to you. What do you need help with and or how can you help others? I like that couple of questions. Um, where we can help you, I believe, is what I mentioned, trying to better align your strategies. You can't do everything at once. You have done an amazing, amazing job over a very short period of time. And I would to, uh, like to commend Paul. I've met him just before COVID and he was not in the same place he is now. Uh, very impressive. But the alignment between basic, the baseline values that every sports organization should respect without reinventing the wheel, uh, and the alignment with uh, uh, development uh, goals. That is something we can really help you with. No sports federation needs to do that by itself. There's a lot of consensual work done already, uh, and we are ready to do that and would be very helpful, uh, I think, in this respect. Where well, we need your help, and here I turn to, uh, to the athletes. Uh, we need you athletes, the, the top athletes of, of this uh, sport, to think of the bottom of the pyramid. What makes eSport so important for us is the billions of people practicing it. And you have a role to play. We have examples from traditional sports of top athletes in a country gathering to try and influence the system, the sports system as such, not just in your sport. You can give back to eSport, right? Uh, and I think uh, to build that in, Right now, you have all a lot of skills that can really make the uh, world a better place and can make your community, your esport community, uh, uh, be a better community. And I think that is something we can also help with. We have examples, Brilliant. but that's also where you can help us. And the final point, technology. I will be very open. I'm here for that as well. We need technology and we need your skills again, the skills of the people in this room, the skills of your industry partners. It's not about money. It's about connecting the world uh, through technology and we can't advance our work in the UN uh, and eSport can play a tremendously important role in that. Thank you very much. Okay, over to you. Uh, let's start with Andy. Briefly, please, can you tell me what do you need help with and 
how can you help others? I'm going to turn it around. Um, how can we help others? Well, we can help with connections. At British Esports, um, we're a grassroots organisation, um, and we can help connect all of you uh, with our industry. Um, and we, we'll do that with a smile on our face. So that's how we can help. What do we need help with? Well, British Esports is in its sixth year now. Um, it wouldn't be where it is without Chester King. Uh, we've had to fight and scrap um, because that's our nature to get our uh, organization to be um, significant, essential, and helpful. Um, we would like to get some, some government support. Um, we'd, we're not a handout organization. Let's just be really clear about that. We're going to do it anyway, but it would be nice occasionally for the grassroots to get some funding to put you know, the youth clubs, the club back into youth, and that would be very powerful. Philip makes a really good point about physical and mental health levels going backwards. This makes me sad. We should be able to do so much more for young and old, okay? It's not an age thing, um, and we need to do it faster because that every day that we delay, more people don't have fun. Brilliant, thank you very much. Katie, over to you. What do you need help with and how can you help others? I'm going to just pick the one question, how can we help others? Okay. Um, and I, I guess we're a membership-based organisation. We, uh, we have 72 members and that the ability to open up the, those members' mindsets in terms of the sport continuum um, and this is what this is about. I mean, I spoke on a forum a couple of weeks ago uh, at the Indian Sports uh, Esports Federation put on and it, one of their challenges was getting that kind of legitimacy in terms of getting investment from their government from a sports perspective mm -hmm. and uh, and so you know being associated with us and embracing the esports movement I think will help with the growth of the members of the Global Esports Federation as well. Wow that's amazing thank you and Paul the last one goes to you um, what do you need help with and or how can you help others? I think one of the things where we could help others with is this notion of being a hyper connector. So I think that if we don't know the answers, we don't know the answers to many things, but we know we might know who does. So that's a very, I think, helpful thing for the community. Um, and we need help from the community to shape the global, the, the landscape, Andy, around global esports, don't we? We need the help from everyone to chime in. One of the things, Mark Che's in the room, our executive director. Hi, Mark. And um, uh, Mark Che is an Olympian, he's a Commonwealth Games athlete, he's uh, the president of Singapore Swimming, and he's our executive um, director for community and administration. And one of the things that Mark does every single month is lead our group in um, what we call um, Town Hall, World Connected Town Hall. And what's been interesting over those two years as we've done it, is we really believe that if we're not meeting our community every single month, we're not serving our community. We want to meet our community more, not just every single month, much more. But what's now happened in those um, uh, town hall meetings, it used to be a lot of us presenting. All of our meetings at the Global Esports Federation, um, and Katie believes in this as well, is maximum an hour. But it used to be that we spoke for about 40 minutes or 50 minutes. Now we speak for about 26 minutes and we listen for about 30 minutes from questions. And the community, one of the most beautiful things for us from our community is for them to say, how can I help this federation, as Andy said, that's got a challenge there, how can I help that federation, putting their hand up saying, I want to be able to help. We need to do much, much more of that. Um, and um, listening to our community, listening to the athletes here today, Katie, at the, um, at the Commonwealth Esports Championships about the experience that you've had, but also how we can improve that. And that's something that we promise to do much more of. Brilliant, thank you very much. It's a really nice icebreaker as well. If you're going to be doing some networking, to start with, how can I help you? What's, what's the problem that you have at the moment? How can I help you solve it? Um, well, panelists, thank you ever so much for all of your amazing insights. It's been a real pleasure spending time with you all this morning. And audience, thank you too for your kind and generous attention. The next panel is going to be right here in just a few minutes with Chester. It's going to be a deep dive into all things Commonwealth eSports. And I'll be back at 12 or around then for a panel on business, technology and education. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you.